Hello there and welcome to this, the 10th episode of Beyond the Studio. It's hard to believe we've been going this long already. My name is Paul Nolan. I am the host of Beyond the Studio for MYT, the platform that's there to help you become the best artist you can be in electronic music by becoming the very best version of yourself. So this 10th episode is a little different from the other ones that we've presented to you so far. This is a solo episode from yours truly where i do a little bit of a deep dive into a very important and very universal subject it is of course overcoming the fear of failure it's something that we all face in life we all have fear about what we would like to have happen in our lives our dreams our goals etc we have fear and doubt about whether or not they're going to happen and whether or not things are going to work out and it's possibly the most common thing i see in myt AAA members and also in coaching clients that i've worked with over the years so this felt very important to share with you as the 10th episode of the podcast and it is something that we did way back at the beginning of myt AAA, and it's something that i actually have listened back to recently and weirdly listened to myself and actually reminded myself of a lot of things so it feels good to do this bit of a deep dive and of course this was an NYT AAA masterclass that we did live so you will hear things like comments and stuff like that and questions from the NYT AAA members and if you want to join us for content like this and a lot more you would be more than welcome you can head over to www.transition.com studio for more information and to sign up the trial costs just seven pound for the first seven days and it is a very low monthly cost after that so if you want more information you can head over to the website but without much further ado i'm going to hand it over to well me talking about overcoming the fear of failure enjoy so yeah fear of failure I mean, where do you even start with that? You know, it's such a, a such a common thing, right? And obviously, like anything else that we do on here and on any of the other masterclasses, the courses, and anything else, you know, we need to break it down. But before we do that, there's something that I wanted to share with you guys, and. I wanted to bring your attention to a post. Okay, so I'm just going to bring this up on the screen here, which is going to be right next to me right here. So this guy, Michael Rinzen, as he's already known as, is well known as, signed to Mousetrap, amongst others, including Chapter 24, and he's going to be playing for us in Amsterdam for our ADE party. So the headline is being John Monkman, Rinzen and myself and he put this post up like yesterday and I thought it really resonated with the conversations that we've been having on the group as well as what needs to be discussed tonight so I'm going to read this out for you know those of you who might not be able to see it properly but you know it it really really sits quite well with what we're talking about tonight So, as it goes, the pressure to make it. As a culture, we're obsessed with the idea of making it. We dream about one day reaching some insane level of success. That means we have arrived and we can be content now. That's such a powerful thing, isn't it? Because we do all do that to an extent. Artists are especially susceptible to this. There's already so much pressure to prove that this path that we've chosen is not some crazy pipe dream that will never pay off. I often wonder how much of our art is motivated by this pressure to make it. And I think that's a really good point, right? Like, how much are we influenced by that need to, quote-unquote, you know, succeed or, you know, quote-unquote, to, like, you know, make it? How much do we lose our own individual creative voices because of a preconceived notion that we must sort of fit in somewhere? How often are we thinking this needs to be the biggest song, the best video, the craziest photo, 
This needs to be the thing that will propel me to a new echelon of success. I know I'm guilty of it, and I'm sure we all are as well. The problem is when we approach our creativity like this, it's tainted. We're not expressing ourselves authentically. Instead, we're creating with the mindset of making it. And that has nothing to do with art. Music and art is not about making it or being successful, but about expressing an idea as honestly and as profoundly as possible. I believe that just by creating something, just by seeing an idea all the way through to the finish line, you've already done something extraordinary. Quite literally, you've made a thing. And because of that, you are worthy. So go make things and stop worrying about making it. And, you know, there's a bit of a subtext to this with Michael and I, because I actually mentored Michael for a while when I lived in Los Angeles. And, you know, he's always been an interesting guy. He was, previous to that, the managing editor of Dancing Astronaut, which is one of the bigger blogs in dance music. And now he's signed to Mousetrap. He often spends his time touring with and opening for Dead Mouse. So he's done an incredible thing straight away. So, you know, as a kickoff to fear of failure as a as a topic, yeah, you know, I couldn't think of anywhere better to start because he makes incredible points that we do put too much pressure on ourselves to quote unquote make it, to be successful. And we then get ourselves into a state of fear about whether or not it's going to happen, why may it happen or not happen to us, why is it happening to somebody else and not me, all of these different things, and it can become quite a toxic experience. And if we're not careful, this fear of failure can lead to us getting into all sorts of trouble in terms of our mental health, but it can also get us into all kinds of trouble where our musical expression is concerned. And I can tell you from my experience, having gone through my own mental health troubles, it all kind of began in large part through the fear of failure. And it's been an amazing thing actually reading all of your comments, those of you who felt called or felt comfortable with sharing what you've shared on that that kind of comment thread on the group because we're going to go through them later on but we're going to go through them in the context of some things that I have to say and I have a lot to say on the subject because to reflect on my own personal journey as this masterclass or this this talk gives me the opportunity to it really makes me appreciate just how far I've come in the last three years because this here, this little term here has honestly just bugged me my entire life and continues to, but to a far lesser extent. And I'll tell you how I've gotten myself into a position where I'll be, I'm not as motivated by the fear of failure as much anymore. And I'm not as affected by it. But like we said, you know, we have to really think first of all about, you know, what is fear? And again, like we talk all the time, right, about, you know, what is a kick drum? You know, what is a goal? What is this? What is that? You know, what we define things here in an attempt to break things down and to understand them to much deeper levels. So let's do it with fear. And the funny thing is about breaking fear down is that it's scary, which is ironic, right? That we're so scared of fear that we can't even break it down. So we're going to do that, though. And obviously, fear can be different for different people. But my preferred definition of fear is an outcome that we do not desire. So we live in a constant state of anxiety about the 
non-desired outcome becoming a reality. Now, the further irony of that is that we are making the undesirable outcome more likely by fear in it. And you have to think about the nature of fear itself and, and where it comes from. And we are going to get to the roots of a lot of this in, you know, and give you my take on it. And again, it'll be different for different people. So hopefully what I'm about to say and how I help you in this will resonate. But again, fear essentially is something that we are all unconsciously driven by. And it can be positive because a certain amount of fear will present itself in life in order to keep you safe. You know, fear of heights, for example. Fear of loud noises. They're two very essential, very primal fears that stop you from falling off a cliff and keep you away from dangerous animals or from dangerous situations. Okay, Outside of that, we don't really have a lot to fear. And that might sound counterintuitive. And I can tell you there's somebody who was run on fear as a primary fuel source for a number of years. I can tell you that that feels like it might feel like a completely alien concept to you so far. But my favorite definition of what fear actually is, is this. And you might have seen this before. Fear stands for false evidence appearing real. So, false evidence appearing real. It's an interesting one, isn't it? The fact that what we fear often is more going on inside of our own heads and inside of our own bodies than it is actually on the outside. So, everything that we fear might not actually exist. Because again, what is a fear? If it's false evidence appearing real, then that means, well, it's not real. Fear isn't real. And that's not me saying, go jump off a cliff or go, into get, go and get in a fight with a tiger. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that any sort of fear outside of those quite appropriate fears around survival, around, you know, making sure you've got a roof over your head and making sure, again, you don't die, basically, and you keep yourself safe, physically safe. That is, they're, they're entirely appropriate fears. Every other fear that you have is inappropriate and is a completely, you know, self-made construction, really. So, if that's my definition of what fear is, false evidence appearing real, then what is failure? Because to understand why you're scared of failure, you must understand what failure is to you. And feel free to chime in in the comments as well about like what you feel the word failure means to you. And again, this might seem like quite a, a scary thing to do, but actually like leaning into your fears and figuring out what they are exactly is a very very powerful exercise because the more you lean into them the less power they have over you and the more you'll be able to create with a sense of with a sense of truth shall we say because i'm all about truth that's what i operate on now I don't operate on fear anymore. I, I operate on truth. And to a larger extent, I operate also on love without sounding like, you know, a complete hippie. But the nature of failure, I mean, failure to me is when obviously something does not have the desired outcome. Again, very similar to fear itself in that context. So there's many contexts to failure. So it could be a failure to get signed to a particular record label. It could be failure to get a gig, uh, you know, a party or a promotion that you wanted. 
Failure could be being rejected by that girl or guy that you're into. It can take many, many forms. You know, failure to pass an exam. Failure to live up to your own standards and expectations. And that's where we get into a lot of trouble because if you think about it, a lot of this comes down to actually one word, really. And it's something that I'm going to add in right now because the biggest part of this is what it's about to me. And I've just said the word, okay? Expectations. So really what you can say what failure is, is an inability to meet expectations. Okay? So it's, as Nick saying here, fear and failure because they kind of go hand in hand. Fear to him is disappointing the people that he cares about. And that's an interesting one because you are, to an extent, there living with the supposed expectations of other people, as in what they expect of you or what you imagine they expect from you. And that's an interesting one because, again, expectations are some of the most troubling things that we can inflict on ourselves. And it's also a, a bit of a challenge to live without expectations. But one thing I can tell you by the fact that I live with far fewer expectations than I used to, I am far happier. And the irony is, if I don't have any expectations of, you know, other people in particular, but if I have realistic expectations about myself, I consistently outstrip even the highest amount of expectation that I have of myself. That's quite an interesting one. Okay, so James Rowe, failure for me is disappointing the closest people around me who have supported and enabled me so far on my music production journey. So you see there's a pattern there that both Nick and James have, and we all have this, and this is something that I've suffered with as well, where, you know, I didn't want to disappoint my family, I didn't want to, you know, give my parents the impression that I've completely wasted my time by going down a non-traditional path. And, you know, I've read a couple of things on the group, on the chat there, on the thread for this, where, you know, people have said, like, you know, their parents have said, like, forget about music, you know, go and get a normal job, you know, what are you doing that for, that kind of thing. And that's an interesting one because you're then living with not only people's positive expectations of you, like Nick is kind of alluding to here, you know, you don't want to disappoint the people that you care about. But a lot of the time we're dealing with negative expectations from family and friends and stuff like that. And that can be quite a difficult thing to have people especially people within your own family, kind of talk you down. Now, I'm quite lucky in that regard where, you know, my parents never did that. My parents have always been supremely proud of what I've achieved and they've never for one moment said to me, like, oh, when are you going to go and get a normal job? You know, obviously they've been concerned on occasion, but specifically my dad, when he was still alive, he was incredibly proud and he also pushed me to go and do the big stuff. You know, he kind of pushed me to move to Los Angeles and go and do what I wanted to do with my life. So I'm supremely fortunate in that regard. But you still project, if that makes sense to you guys, you, you still project what you think they expect onto yourself. And that's something that's that's difficult to live with. And it's also difficult to admit that they're not your friends or families or loved ones' expectations of you. They're actually your imagining of their expectations. And on some form of subconscious level, they're actually your own expectations of yourself that you've just 
kind of thrown onto other people in order to make them a little bit easier to manage. Because if we had those expectations of ourselves, that and when we knew that, that would actually be quite difficult to live with. And I have a, a saying that I like to say about expectations. And it is that expectation is just pain that you book in advance. And that's something that, you know, I've kind of realised within the last couple of years, especially within the last 12 months to 18 months. And it has been something that has helped me tremendously in that time frame, which allowed me to see the futility of expectation because expectations are also fundamentally misunderstood. Okay. Expectations are grafted over or under things like goals. They're grafted or masked by things like ambition, like drive, hustle, motivation, all of these things. And on some sort of subconscious level, we actually think that having expectations is a good thing. And I'm here to kind of tell you that it's bullshit. Expectations is just absolute uh, a suicide mission, quite frankly. And it has helped me to liberate myself by liberating myself from a sense of expectation. Because they're a form of negative reinforcement, if that makes sense. Like, say, for example, what I mean by negative reinforcement is if I was on this group and let's say, for example, we were doing a goal set in progress call and I was literally calling you guys out and calling you all the bastards walking for not achieving your goals and punishing you guys and humiliating you in public and, you know, kicking you out the group and stuff like that. That is the most negative connotation of you know again negative reinforcement but we often do this to ourselves through our expectations because i saw a few people on the chat say that they have like you know high expectations of themselves and again expectations they get confused for things like standards and you can have high standards for yourself and that's absolutely fine but you can have that in the context of also having no expectations of yourself. Because again, an expectation is a pressure that you put on yourself. And therefore, when that expectation of yourself is not met, when you, you know, don't finish that track or you clunk that DJ mix, you know, that transition in a DJ mix, or you don't play well at the gig, or, you know, you don't run fast enough or, you know, don't lift heavy enough weights or you do this, that and the other. It leads to a very, very big problem. And that problem is, and I've seen it again on a couple of the, the comments, it leads to a feeling of not feeling like you're good enough and not feeling like you're enough. And that is something that I can really, really resonate with because without making this into like, you know, my sort of personal biography, I've got to say it, you know, for a number of years and for the vast majority of my adult life, I made myself feel like a piece of shit because I didn't feel like I was worth anything because I had way too high expectations of myself. I was way too ambitious and I put so much pressure on myself to achieve goals and to completely, you know, dominate the game and, you know, be this big time thing. Again, making it, as Michael, as Rinsen put it in the quote that I read out at the beginning, that I completely crumbled under the weight of my own expectation. So we have to be very, very careful about that. And it can be a difficult thing to see. So a lot of this tonight might be quite difficult to, to hear, but it's it's honestly, it's huge. It really is. And I think this will be the number one thing that will unlock a lot of you to go off and really hit the ground running in the next three months. I really, really do. 
because as much as you know i'm so happy that you guys are working on trello and goals and i'm giving you these goal setting sheets and everything else and helping you to create systems you know it's nothing if your self-esteem or if your sense of self-worth gets pushed through the fucking gutter in the process of trying to achieve it because it's not worth it it's not worth it and it's not how we create to the best of our ability you know so as james is saying here 100 percent in that making myself feel like shit both shit both yeah exactly mate and you know what the horrible thing is about that boat mate is that it always fucking sinks under the weight of your own turds forgive the the phrasing and yeah dennis totally identifies as well so yeah i mean as i said this is going to be a doozy and you know i'm i'm quite well versed in a lot of this and i want to really be quite open and quite frank with you guys as well you know so if expectations is a real problem then we have another aspect to this and let me just peel off for a second because there's another comment coming here i sometimes experience fear of failure when i look at my other colleagues and friends getting their music signed to labels although i'm very happy to see them all do well i distract myself from focusing on myself that's an interesting one isn't it and there's another tagline or another word that we can get into which is comparison jesus christ did i go through some comparison bullshit i put myself through comparison bullshit because you know i was comparing myself to people who were a lot older than me to be quite honest i used to compare myself to people who i now consider to be, and i realize are mentors so i used to compare myself to mike cave believe it or not i used to compare myself to sasha i used to compare myself to every single one of my friends who were also incredible artists and what i realized was that i was using it as a tool to make myself feel like shit because on some level i didn't feel like i was good enough and i didn't feel like i was enough and the honest thing is, is that a lot of people say well you know you'll get signed to a good label or you know this will happen and you'll feel good enough then and that is such a trap that is such a huge trap because if you think about the actual structure of that statement what you're saying is i'll be happy when this that and the other will happen and of course what happens is that you get to a point where you get to that point and you still feel like shit so that's a real problem and i've been there I've absolutely been there and the whole thing is very very tricky because you get yourself to a point where where I was back end of 2016 and you know just made an album with Sasha the vinyl for which is just behind me there and I'm living in Los Angeles and I'm living the dream as so social media makes it look like I'm opening for the likes of Matthew Deere and DJ3 and I'm playing in San Diego with like, you know, all the Guardi Safari crew and I'm playing with Harvard Bass and all these guys and then headlining gigs in New York and all sorts of stuff and it's going on the surface, great guns. And it looks like I've achieved everything I've set out to achieve. Making albums with legends, living in Los Angeles, buddies who are electronic and film music legends hot girlfriend the whole nine yards and let me tell you that is the most shit i've ever felt in my entire life and it was a very difficult time it was actually the most difficult time of my whole life and i don't want that to sound like all hashtag djs complaining and hashtag first world problems but the thing is is that you know at that point i could have been a billionaire and you know i could have had more money than elon musk and i would have been just as depressed and just as you know 
on such a low ebb because I didn't feel like I deserved any of it. And I didn't feel like I was good enough to have it. And I didn't feel like I was, you know, I felt like a complete fraud, basically. But then the irony of that is I was so afraid of failure that it pushed me on to do things that I didn't want to do because I was so scared of this merry-go-round of this wheel coming to an end or this jet, this hamster wheel, if you will, you know, stop and turn and that, you know, I ended up doing complete, almost bloody mental missions, like, you know, flying from LA to Bali to play one gig to fly all the way back, you know, which again, on the face of it, sounds glorious, sounds like, oh my God, I'd love to do that, until you do it and you realise how difficult that is, you know? So it's interesting that, you know, we use other people in all honesty, to go back to the comment here, as a way of either distracting ourselves from ourselves or we use it, other people, as a way of making ourselves feel like shit or to justify where we're at, when really it's none of our business and each individual has their own path. And as I say, you know, I was making ridiculous comparisons to other people. I was comparing myself to, you know, naturally talented, God-given freaks like James Abela. You know, I was comparing myself to, as I say, people I had no business comparing myself to because they were older, more experienced. They were at a different stage in life. You know, I'm 24, 25 comparing myself to Sasha. You know, he's got 10 years on me at least. Complete nonsense, complete nonsense. But the whole thing rolls back to one thing, because if we have expectations, then it means that we have another thing. And this is a problem. We have attachment. So we're attached to the goal, right? So we've set the goal like we have done last week, but we've also become attached to that goal because we've given that thing meaning. And, you know, I did that again, just to use my LA example of, excuse me, of, you know, I'm going to be happy when I move to LA. And of course I got to LA and I was fucking miserable. But I put so much into, and I needed to achieve that goal of moving to LA and I needed to achieve that goal of working with Sasha and working with Junkie XL and working with film composers and everything else and playing these gigs and doing everything that I wanted to do, that everything kind of crumbled because I was so attached to the goal and I was so attached to the achievement of that goal that my entire sense of self-worth and self-value became wrapped up, like I've said on a couple of occasions, in the achievement of that goal. And when they either don't happen or they don't happen the way you imagined, or they do happen and you realise that you're not in a position to be able to fully enjoy that goal because you've put yourself through the ringer so much that you can't appreciate it for what it is. It's very similar to what gold medalists say at the Olympics, or say, for example, when Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France in 2012, he talked about this a lot because... You know, he was expecting his life to change when, you know, he he becomes the first British cyclist to win a Tour de France. And he gets home and he's still got to, you know, put his put his trash out. He's still got to put his rubbish out. He's still got to do the recycling. He's still got to go to the supermarket. He's still got to wipe his own bum. And nothing changes. So we get to that place, that there, that we think everything is going to be better. And it's no better than where we are now. And if we're fucking miserable now, then it's like, well, shit, what are we going to do? So a lot of that comes down to attachment. You place value and you need, quote unquote, you need to complete the goal in order to feel good about yourself. Again, I will be happy when ABC happens. And it's not a good way to live your life because 
you know, I will be happy when I meet a girl. I will be happy when I win the lottery. I will be happy when I'm, I don't know, an internationally recognised touring DJ. It's a lot of pressure to put yourself under. And the truth is, is that attachments lead to expectations. And then expectations lead to this. Leads to suffering. Now, we suffer because we don't get what we're attached to. Okay. Now, forgive me for this because this is deep. Like, I'm going uber deep on this. But I figured that's what you pay me for. So let's let's really get into it. Okay. So I definitely have done my fair share of suffering, whether it be through being attached to people like romantic partners, business partners, uh, musical partners, dreams, goals, situations, that kind of thing. And then when they don't pan out the way that we want them to, you end up feeling a lot of pain because it's the pain of that attachment that turns on you when that expectation does not get met. And that's a real problem. So really we're talking about the root of it all because if you're going to talk about you know, various spiritual traditions, if you're going to talk about Buddhism, for example, the root of, of all suffering is attachment in the Buddhist tradition. So really we have to do something about the fact that we perpetually suffer. And look, suffering is also part of life. But what I would say is this, unnecessary suffering is not part of life. The necessary suffering that we go through as individuals in this weird existence that we have as, you know, admittedly quite baldy pleasure monkeys with the gift of language that we are. The suffering that we rightly go through are through the passing or the death of loved ones, the conflict that we face with people that we love, whether they be friends, family, whoever, you know, partners, romantic partners, whoever. And that is how we learn, right? We suffer and then we learn and we grow from it. But to suffer through things like, say, for example, you know, not achieving the goal of being signed to drum code, as an example, or to suffer because we don't get the DJ gigs that we want and we don't get it when we want it as well, is a choice and it's a choice that that we make and we can either choose to learn from that choice or we can you know learn to live a different way and again the ironic thing about all of this stuff is that when we get on to what we're going to do to overcome this or what we can do to overcome this is that when we let go of all this stuff which don't get me wrong is easier said than done totally because I used to listen to people all the time. You go, oh, yeah, just let go of it. And you'd be like, how the fuck do I let go? I didn't even know I, didn't even know I, was, I was holding on in the first place. So when we get to some strategies around how you can, you know, let go of this stuff, the ironic thing is that actually it makes what you want to have happen more likely. And then into the bargain, it actually makes our lives much more enjoyable. And we can enjoy the process of making music for the sake of making it. So again, to go back to Michael's quote here, you know, I believe that just by creating something, just by seeing an idea all the way to the finish line, you've already done something extraordinary. Quite literally, you've made a thing. Music and art, not about making it or being successful, but about expressing an idea as honestly and as profoundly as possible. So through that, think about it. If that 
is what we're doing and we're expressing our ideas as honestly and profoundly and as authentically as possible. What does attachment have to do with it? What does suffering have to do with it? You know, what does fear have to do with it? To be quite honest. It doesn't really have a great deal to do with it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not sat here saying that I'm going to make all of your fears of failure go away instantly by the end of this masterclass, because that would be quite a bold claim. And quite frankly, if I could do that, I would be much richer than I am now, and I'd be charging a hell of a lot more. <laughs> However, if we can start down the road of awareness, that's the first stage in all of this. What I'm so happy about is the level of self-awareness you guys have in the group is amazing. The fact that you are aware that you are afraid in the first place and you can admit in a public forum, okay, within the context of our community, you can admit that you have fear and you experience it and you feel like it limits you. That's huge. So I want to take a moment like right now just to say thank you for the level of honesty, the level of self-awareness and just the level of willingness that you guys have to really go to where you need to go in order to move your lives and move yourselves on as people to the next level. This is exactly like this is not an empty throwaway thing that I say when I went on Dan's Your Music Industry podcast. If you guys haven't heard it, I recommend having a listen to the whole bunch of them because they're fantastic podcasts. I said that personal development and artist development are the same thing. And you can't be the best artist you can be without be first becoming the, the best version of yourself. And I totally, truly and authentically believe that. So in order to allow yourselves to make the music that you are capable of writing and having listened to your tracks, you've got incredible, incredible talent. What you can do on the other side of all of this fear of failure, because it does limit us, it stops us from going forward, it stops us from becoming what we can become fully. And that's why, you know, one of my tracks earlier this year was called The Becoming, because it was a meditation, if you will, or it was a, an expression of me moving to the next level in my life and leaving a lot of this shit behind and not allowing it to affect me anymore. And through that, being able to help other people to get to that place as well. So, obviously we have attachments that we're human and one of the biggest things that we'll ever try and do is let go of those attachments. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. And that's something that I'll be working on for the rest of my life. Now, where is fear? That's an odd question, isn't it? Just to move on to this. Where is fear actually happening? Now, this is like a little bit of a trick question, but not really. Because if you think about it, let's look at some of these statements. Let's look at some of these comments I experience fear of failure when I look at my other colleagues and friends getting their music signed to labels, okay? Failure for me is disappointing the people closest around me. Fear to me is disappointing the people I care about, okay? Now, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because every single one of those statements is a statement based on an internal state. It's your own internal state. So when I ask where fear is located, excuse me, alcohol-free beer, by the way. When I ask when or where fear is located, if you think about all of those statements, it means one thing. It means that fear is located in only one place, and it is not outside of you. Fear is located 100% 
internally within us within our own minds and within our own bodies and having done a lot of work on my own fears and overcome a lot of fears and felt the growth from that I can tell you that that is absolutely an objective fact that okay it may appear that all of the things that you fear are happening outside of you that might appear to be the way that it is however your response of fear from something else is entirely an internal thing so if you have fear around not achieving certain goals that is nothing to do with the outside world that's everything to do with the inside of you that's all to do with the internal world that you live within because without getting into another quite deep and philosophical conversation about the nature of existence lord knows i love those conversations but i really haven't taken enough mushrooms to have them yet but we won't go there everything is happening inside of us and we are living life from the inside of us outwards now it might appear that we are living from the outside world inwards because we react to things every day we swerve to avoid hitting people with our cars we curse when the bus or the train is late we you know we get annoyed at people that apparently make us feel a certain way but the truth of the matter is that actually everything is happening within us all of our happiness all of our sadness all of our joy all of our sorrow and yes all of our fear and also as well all of the limiting beliefs that we have to deal with so yeah we can get into like the origin of limiting beliefs and stuff like that that's not a problem either however you know we've got a lot to get through here so yeah it's an interesting one so if if fear happens all within us then that means we can do something about it right and just to underline the point before we move on this is one of my favorite quotes and this is from a stoic philosopher called seneca who wrote a book in like roman times basically and the stoics were big back in the day people like marcus aurelius seneca epictetus people like that and stoic philosophy for those of you who don't know the central ten of it is quite beautiful and it's gaining a lot of traction a lot of popularity in these quite muddled and quite intense times that we have right now and stoic philosophy is all about controlling or focusing only on the things that are within our control and letting go of everything else that's not in our control so the quote to read it out is that we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality and i have to tell you that was one of the things that i read within the last sort of three or so years that completely changed my life i think i only read it within the last year year and a half and it's so true that all of our suffering at people or situations not meeting expectations you know whether i don't know carl cox played in big enough dj set or liverpool didn't win the league you know it's all happening within us and this quote more than anything i think explains the fact that everything that we're facing and everything that we're feeling in the the thread that we had before this and also right from the beginning when radu very very bla- bravely you know shared with us 
the fact that he was feeling fear of failure and he didn't know what to do about it. This is why we're here. This is why we're having this chat tonight. So yeah, we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. It's so true. It's so, so true. And it might not feel like that right now, but when you reflect on it, all of the emotions that we feel are as a result of processes and thoughts and experiences that are happening only in one place, and that's within us. And the good news is, is that if it's happening within us, it's also within our control. Okay. So I'm noticing the comments are quite quiet, so I'm wondering whether or not I'm offending people or people are just listening. So feel free to make me feel a little less nervous about what I'm talking about by hitting me up in the comments. Let me know what you guys are feeling, what you're thinking, if this is resonating with you, and you know we'll move on through it. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to go through the rest of these points. I've still got a few points to make. And then we're going to go through some of the comments and some of the conversation that we've had on that thread. And then we'll pick it apart in the context of exactly what I've been talking about. That was my intention. So if you guys want me to cover something else or if you want me to answer any questions, comments are there. You know it. Okay. Now, it's interesting that you know, if we go through that whole thing of attachments and then expectations, an extreme form of expectation is something that is commonly known as perfectionism. Okay. So perfectionism is something that I struggle with on an almost daily basis. And it has honestly, to a larger extent, almost completely fucking ruined my life on more than one occasion. And it's, and it, as I say, it's an extreme form of expectation. Okay, good. James saying he's just listening and yes, very much resonating with him. Thank God for that. thought everybody had left. <laughs> Again, there's my perfectionism going off right there, people, in real time. Just give you a real, real ex uh, exper uh, experience and a real example of that. Okay, great stuff. So, perfectionism. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Again, it's extreme high expectation that everything that you do or everything you know, everything that you do, you know, you should do to the max. You should do it to the best of your ability every single time. Thank you for the reassurance, by the way, guys. Nick, yeah, saying it is a bit of a heavy load. I appreciate that. That's what I thought was going on. And yeah, great, great. Just tell me to shut up if it's doing your heads in anyway. <laughs> so yeah, perfectionism is such an extreme, as I say, an extreme expectation and if I can give you my own, you know, take on it, and I don't mind talking about this, you know, I had extreme perfectionism in my own relationships. And yeah, I'm going to go there for a second. I'm going to go into more of my sort of like, you know, intimate life, if you will, or my personal life. Not too much detail. Don't get me wrong. This won't be a too much information type of thing. But I had extreme perfectionism around my behavior in intimate relationships and in romantic relationships, which led me to being basically a fucking nightmare to be around because everything had to be on point. Everything had to be perfect. And literally, I mean everything from how I drove a car through to how I loaded the dishwasher to how I cooked how I cleaned, how I referred to my partner, everything. So the location of this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because again, I like to think about where these things are located. And you're talking with perfectionism. Perfectionism is not only an extreme expectation. Perfectionism is also an extreme fear. Okay. Because perfectionism manifests itself in an extreme fear of not being good enough and an extreme fear of not being enough. 
for yourself and for the people that you love. And again, as Nick was saying, like, you know, you fear failure because you don't want to disappoint people that you love. Perfectionism is that taken to its extreme. And I often make the joke that I'm a recovering perfectionist and that I'm a fully paid up member to Perfectionists Anonymous. Yeah, and again, there's a really good, really good comment there. The thought that in order to be loved, that you must be perfect. And the ironic thing is, is that without sounding too, you know, new age about it, you know, you already are perfect. You're perfectly imperfect. And that's actually what makes everyone great. So perfectionism is a tough one. And it's something that I have to check in with myself all the time. And it's something that I'm letting go of more and more as time goes on. So I'm going to hit you with another quote about this because I know a few people mentioned perfectionism that, you know, in your, how it manifests in the studio can be in the fact that, you know, my kick drum must be perfect and this must be perfectly mixed down and, you know, the synth sound must be exactly what I'm hearing in my head or, you know, it must sound like it's, you know, at least of the standard of insert ridiculous talented producer that has probably got 15 years of experience on you and about £200,000 of extra gear. Again, not realistic in any way, shape or form. So here's the quote about perfectionism. And I'm not going to tell you who said it because you will tell me to piss off <laughs> at that point. How can perfection be possible in an imperfect world? It's interesting, isn't it? We all know the world's not perfect. I mean, fucking hell, it's 2019. I mean, look what's going on. You know, you've got politicians trying to drive countries off the bridge, off the cliff edge. You've got an absolute nutcase in charge in various different countries around the world without getting too specific. You've got, you know, the environment being of such grave concern. It's not a perfect world. It's not a perfect world by any stretch of the imagination. Nobody's perfect. This world is not perfect. So why do we expect perfection of ourselves? Again, it goes back to that thing. We expect too much of ourselves and we get the message somewhere through our lives that in order to be worthy of love worthy of success, worthy of acceptance, worthy of making it, that we somehow need to express some sort of thing in some incredibly perfect way. And it's just not true. I will tell you who made that quote, and you won't believe me. Believe it or not, it was Oprah Winfrey. Because yes, I listen to Oprah Winfrey podcasts. Don't judge, I'm not perfect. Anyway, David makes a great point here. Da Vinci said, art is never finished, always abandoned. Perfection cannot be reached. And perfectionism is a tough thing to let go of because it means that you have to let go of something far deeper, which is letting go of the notion that you're not good enough and letting go of the notion that you are not enough for what you want to do, for the world that you live in, for the people that love you, for the people that you love. And in the honest answer, the reason why I use the example of my intimate relationships as a an example of my extreme perfectionism is that, ironically, I was being or attempting to be perfect in order to be loved. And the honest answer is, is that I became far less lovable because I was trying to be perfect. 
and you can extrapolate that out into music production if you want. In your attempts to be perfect, to write the perfect track, to do this perfect thing that's going to slot into this particular place in the industry and it's going to get you signed to a particular label and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and I'm going to be happy when that happens is, quite frankly, the definition of insanity. Although, as it is said, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And there's lots to unpack in that statement about not being aware of what your patterns of behaviour are or what your patterns of repetitive, unhelpful action is or are and expecting, again, expectation, expecting results, expecting certain things to happen. That may or may not happen because it may or may not be what you are meant to do. And that's totally fine. But the process is finding out. You know, I still have aspirations. I still have aspirations to be up there on stage with the likes of Sasha and Digweed and everyone else, you know, that I've shared the stage with on, you know, regular occasions in the past. I've still got aspirations to go and play in certain parts of the world. I've still got aspirations to write film scores and write music for film and work with orchestras and do all this stuff. But the honest answer is, is that it, it might not happen. And you've got to be okay with the fact that it might not happen. And in the letting go of control of whether or not that happens, it makes those things far more likely to happen because you're not grasping at them. You're not striving towards them. You're not pushing. I'm very different to a lot of other people who will coach you in this regard. I think I said this on the first goal setting call, but I'll say it again. Hard work is an obvious requirement to do well in any facet of life. However, it is overrated. And if it was as simple as people just working hard enough, we'd all just be working 24-7 and doing whatever we wanted. But that's not how the world works. And it's not how the music industry works. There's a degree of timing. There's a degree of longevity, there's a degree of patience, and there's a degree of things aligning. But also there's lots of different levels of success and there's lots of different versions of success. So one of the ways that we can overcome this fear of failure is to be clear on what success is to us as individuals. Quite frankly, right now, I'm feeling the most successful I ever have done in my life. Because I'm sat here talking to you guys and girls about this exact subject. This is what I set the platform up to do, as well as help you make better music and to help you to become the artists that you all can be. That's my honest answer. Like that, I feel as rich and as wealthy and as successful as I've ever done because of this platform that we've built, this community that we've built that will, you know, help us move on to, to bigger and better things as human beings, as artists, you name it. And I'm not sat here now saying to myself, well, you know, I'm not playing in Argentina with Patrice Baumel, so therefore I'm a piece of shit. It's just completely not helpful and it's not serving in any way, shape or form. So, yeah, this, this is a heavy load. And when I was preparing for this, I was expecting this to be quite heavy. And it's an interesting one as well, because what we've actually just ascertained here, perfection cannot be reached, as David just said. And perfectionism and perfect doesn't exist. And that, again, is a big moment for me as somebody who lived his life in the pursuit of perfect to admit to myself and to accept the fact that as a concept perfectionism cannot exist in a perfect in an imperfect world and perfect does not exist and it never has done and it never will then that frees us up right it liberates us in order to do what's good enough by our own standards 
And the fact is, is it's an iterative process that we must have patience to apply. You know, if you listen to the first tracks I ever wrote compared to what I'm writing now, the difference is astonishing. The difference is night and day. And for those of you who are, you know, in a slightly different part of your journey than I am, that's going to be very much the case for you guys, you know? And I know a lot of you will say, well, yeah, I'd love to actually finish some tracks for starters. But that's also part of the process. And if you even hold the fact that you want to finish tracks as an aspiration rather than a need, rather than a hard, I need to do this, otherwise I'm not going to be happy, then it's going to become, as I say, way more likely to happen. It's not about expectations. It's about hopes. And it's about aspirations. And pointing yourself in the right direction. So again, this comes back to goal setting. Realism in that SMART acronym that we looked at in the very first call of NYT AAA ever last month. Can you believe it's only a month ago? Wonderful, isn't it? So perfectionism doesn't exist. And the interesting one as well is that a lot of people fear as well. And this is something that I, again, have been dealing with. And I deep deal with on a very, very deep level. This other word, rejection. And th this is one of the most powerful limiting beliefs that we have. It's a huge, huge barrier that we don't often see. Okay. And this is it. Enjoying the process. Happiness is in the journey, not the destination. Because the truth of the matter is, there is no destination. There's only the process. To, you know, roll back into this comment here. And one of the things that I love, I can't remember who who the interview was with, but it was with this really famous cello player. I think the guy was like Portuguese, I'm not quite sure. I saw it in a, I think it was in a magazine or something. And what was really interesting with me was, uh, with this quote, was that it really deeply resonated. And they asked this guy, he was like 90-odd, and he was like this you know, world-famous cello player, played in orchestras for donkey's years. And they asked him, like, why are you still practicing cello five hours a day at the age of 91? And his response was incredible. His response was, well, I'm still practicing cello five hours a day because I still think I'm getting better. I mean, just think about that for a second. Still applying the process at that age is incredible. And if you think about it, you know, there's incredible examples of people that age, like running marathons and all sorts of stuff, right? Very, very interesting. So if you enjoy the process, then rejection becomes less of a thing, right? It becomes less of a problem. So again, if you think about that in the context of getting DJ gigs or getting tracks signed in particular, it can be tough because, you know, a lot of people will say no. And that can lead people to feel rejected because apparently the record label of their dreams has rejected them. They've said, no, thank you, that's not good enough. The message we get subconsciously through our bruised egos and through our minds is that, oh, that means we're not good enough. When it couldn't possibly be the case. Because if we think about this for a second, there's something else that's going on. Okay? Okay. Rejection doesn't exist either. 
and this is one of the big flaws in a lot of people's mindsets that I see not only in musicians, but also in life. That we walk around every day acting like rejection is a real thing. That we're rejected by people. That we're rejected by the record label we wanted to be signed to. We're rejected by the club promoter that we wanted to play their party. We're rejected by the person we have a crush on. We're rejected by the company we wanted to work for. We're rejected by the people we love. And we're rejected by the people that we want to love. And we're rejected by the world. Okay. So, hopefully this resonates because one of the other things that I've really come to live by is this. There's no such thing as rejection. There's only redirection. So when a record label says no, or a promoter says no thank you, or a person says no thank you, or whatever the situation is, your application has not been successful, or, you know, computer says no. You are actually being steered towards what it is you're actually meant to do and what you're meant to have. And again, just because it's a no right now doesn't mean it's a no forever. Because time comes into it as well. So I have the same attitude towards rejection as I do towards expectations or perfectionism, I should say. Neither of them exist as concepts as far as I'm concerned. So, Sinisa, I'm more annoyed by the lack of reaction from labels, not afraid of rejection. So that's good, because that's a healthy attitude to have. But again, if labels don't get back to you, then that's to utilise some stoic philosophy that is kind of outside of your control. There are obviously ways in which you can deal with that where you know you can be politely persistent which is something i honestly you know promote to a lot of my clients and i will promote to a lot of you guys when we get onto the subject of how do we get signed how do we send them a demo things like that and you know how we can do everything that's within our power and then let go of everything else. And I was talking to a, a client earlier about the fact that a big techno label had, quote unquote, rejected them. And I said to this person that, you know, there can be a multitude of reasons why. And almost all of them will have nothing to do with you. It may well be that they're feeling a different sound. It may well be they have a different vision for the label that you're not aware of. In the case of Chapter 24, sometimes our release schedule is up to 8 to 12 months in advance. So we often, again, I hate to say it, occasionally we don't react because, again, time is an issue. But also as well, the fact is we've... You know, we, we've got everything that we need. And it's a difficult thing to respond to everyone. So again, the lack of reaction is not a reflection of you, which I'm sure that, you know, you understand based on what your comment is here. But it's a reflection of, you know, an uncontrollable part of reality, basically. To get onto that subject for a second, the number one thing you can do to offset that is to develop relationships with label managers and people who are close to people who manage labels. Because I can tell you on a on a on a real one for a second, those kind of like demos at emails, which I'm sure you understand anyway, but it's worth making the point here. Those demos at setlabel.com demo emails. A lot of the time, they don't get listened to because there's just so much music being thrown in. And unfortunately, we can get lost in the shuffle. You know, I nearly got lost in the shuffle at Bedrock. But thankfully, you know, John immediately listened to my music and loved what he heard. Which, again, 
I sent those demos into Bedrock and his reaction to them is completely beyond my control. So I have to just sort of let go of of that and thankfully, you know, it became one of the highlights of my year to release on that label. So yeah, I totally, totally get where you're coming from. Okay. So as we said, there's no such thing as rejection. There's only redirection. So I want to move on to another thing that I'm quite passionate about. And it's actually something that I helped young Dan out, Dan Fisher from Your Music Industry Podcast, who, as you know, is part of the team here at MYT Towers. And it's the most damaging word in the world. And if anyone knows me to a, 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 a fair degree you'll know that I have a bigger issue with most with this word than I do with most supposedly profane swear words. Okay, have a little think about what that could be. I'm sure I'm going to get some amusing, amusing reactions in the comments on this. As he takes another swig of his alcohol-free beer. So, the most damaging word in the world is one of the most innocuous. Should. You have no idea how much I absolutely fucking despise this word. I have all but eliminated it, by and large, from my vocabulary. Think about it for a second. What the word should contains. <laughs> Yeah, EDM, yeah, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, comes close, anyway, apologies to any EDM producers who are now watching this on the replay, um, should is a terrible word, and as I say, I've got fewer issues with the word fuck than I have with the word should, especially with the frequency I say the F word, but we won't go there. Should means that I'm wrong. I should have done that because what I did was wrong. Therefore, I should have done something different because I didn't match up to my expectations. Therefore, I am not good enough. I am not enough. I am a piece of shit. See the way it all links together. Excuse me. So, ultimately, should means that you're wrong. Or this should have happened. I should have gotten that DJ gig. I should have been signed to that label. I should be on that lineup. I should be over there and not where I am now. So should links up quite dramatically with expectations because should is an expression of expectation and it's an expression of your expectations not being met or you not living up to expectations. So I pointed this out to, to Dan a while ago that he was using this word quite a lot. And I hope Dan doesn't mind me telling this story. But Dan, I, I actually mentioned it to him in a couple of, like, you know, private messages. And he came back to me the day after and he was like, oh, my God, I can't believe how much I was using that word to turn in and turn against myself. You should have done that, you stupid bastard. Can't believe he did that. You should have done this instead. You know? And then you have to deal with the word should from other people. You should do this. You should have done that. Should I? No, well, you know, I could have done something else. But I didn't, did I? So, 
so we have to live with again the expectations of other people and other people projecting their expectations onto you and another one of my favorite lines which i haven't got an overlay for so do forgive me but it goes something like this what other people think of you is none of your business there's another one to live by i'm like a walking instagram quote tonight aren't i i'm like a motivational meme on instagram in human form i do apologize i shouldn't have done that um but yeah it's it's the, it's the worst thing man seriously because should just implies judgment things not being the way they should be so think about it and, and monitor yourself the next time that you you use the word should just take a little step back and think about it think about in what context you use that word and were you using it in a judgmental way towards yourself or other people or towards a situation or to the world were you using it in a way to express that your expectations were not met where you were expressing your fear of failure through what you should have done it's a big problem i guarantee you'll start using the word should a lot less once you start taking a bit of time and giving yourself a bit of presence to understand how you talk to yourself and how you talk to other people through the use of the word should and in general as well another one that was a big epiphany for me in the last couple of years is i realized that if i talked to other people in the street the way that i talk to myself i'd be in a hospital with a broken jaw so we must always be very very careful about how we talk to ourselves and our relationship to ourselves because indeed that is the most important relationship that we have is the relationship to ourselves and it's also the only lifelong relationship that you're in so where's the root of all this where does all of this fear come from you know where's the the origin point of where this fear comes from this fear of failure and this fear of not meeting people's expectations or not meeting your own expectations it's quite an interesting one isn't it because i'm sure we're at a point where we can't even remember where this first happened and there's a good reason for it because normally without going into a whole sigmund freud carl young thing which i can if you want don't get me wrong i'm super interested in all that stuff but it mostly happens in childhood you know we get messages either from you know our caregivers or family members or childhood friends or school teachers or you know people who are around us at that childhood phase which is incredibly important that we're not good enough that we don't deserve to be loved that we're not perfect and we should be perfect in order to be loved and we have to be perfect in order to do what we want to do with our lives and you should do this and you should do that reflect on your own childhood for a second and think about those situations and think about the pressures that you were probably put under by the people who were there to you know look after you the most and don't get me wrong i'm not blaming them i'm not saying that they were wrong in any way shape or form end of the day i know loads of people my age at the minute who are having kids and it makes me realize that you know what my parents were winging it as well because nobody's got a fucking clue but ultimately it does take root within us and that means that even though it's definitely not our fault that it's there it is definitely our responsibility to own those feelings of fear to take responsibility for them to accept them for what they are and that is the first stage in overcoming it 
So we're moving into a different thing here because obviously we've highlighted a lot of stuff here. So I'm going to move it into a much more practical. And like, what do we do about this? I mean, I've just spent over an hour, nearly an hour and a half, talking about expectations and perfectionism and everything else. Like, what do we do? What do we do? As Sinisa says here, it's like dragging the past along. It's not constructive and not letting it have a closure. Learning from it, yes, and not feeding the regrets. And it's an, that's an amazing point, that dude, honestly, because that's what I was doing for the vast majority of my life, was that I was dragging along this sense of, again, not feeling good enough because of, you know, what happened in my past. You know, I was in not great relationships and had a very tough time of it when I was a kid. You know, I was pretty severely bullied at school. And I don't mind talking about that. I don't mind talking about anything because it doesn't have any power on me anymore. It doesn't have any power over me. And, you know, you might be sitting here wondering what the fuck has this got to do about making good techno? But it has a huge amount to do with how we fulfil our potential as individuals and as human beings. And, you know, to make a general point for a second, like, I started MYT. Think about what the name of MYT means. Make your transition. It could also mean something else. It could also mean master your transformation. And that's what this company and what this whole platform was set up to do was to help people transform from where you are to the very highest version and the highest potential of yourself as a human being and as an artist to use music as a way to trigger self-awareness, self-growth, self actualization, fulfilling your potential as an individual. And we can only do that by learning from our experiences. And again, to move on to a more solutions-based situation. How can we resolve it? Excuse me. How can we not just move past it? Because, you know, a lot of what we're told what to do is actually not great. Ah, you know, just put it behind you. Uh, don't think about that anymore. You know, uh, you know. I don't know why you keep bringing this up. I got all of those and, and then some. Especially over the last few years, because, you know, it was very much a process for me of unpacking everything that I'd been through and being able to let go of a lot of stuff. And that really is, you know, number one in resolution. It's an easy thing to say, but letting go. Whatever it is that's driving those feelings of not being good enough and that fear of failure, you must manoeuvre yourself into a position where you can let it go. Now, by letting go, I'm not talking about, you know, not thinking about it anymore, but it's still there in the background. Because... You know, whatever you don't confront that way, whatever you don't heal, unconsciously ends up controlling you. And that was very much the case with me. My latent and, you know, latterly blatant perfectionism, my lack of self-worth, my lack of value that I assigned to myself. I didn't feel like my voice was... Equal to others. I felt like it was less important. I felt like I was less important than other people. And the way that I tried to remedy that was by fixing people. Ironically, I wasn't fixing myself. The only person who wasn't being fixed in that situation was me. Because my thought process was, well, if I fix other people, then, you know, people are like me. But really... What I needed to work on was my relationship to myself. Again, it's the only lifelong relationship we're all in, but it's the one that we neglect the most. So how do we... 
how do we let go? Well, this is where the rest of the points come in. Forgiveness. And mostly for ourselves, as well as for other people. There were a lot of people in my life that I had to forgive, without going into too much detail. That I allowed them to treat me in a way that wasn't in line with my worth. And how can you get other people to treat you with dignity, respect and value when you don't value yourself? So actually, the first person I had to forgive through that process was myself. Because I had to forgive myself for not valuing myself and for not defining and defending my own boundaries. Tough. 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 And, you know, I had to forgive people who did some pretty shitty things to me when I was younger. But I wasn't forgiving them for their own sake. Even though I now realise that only hurt people hurt people. If you've heard that phrase. You know, I was targeted at primary school because of the pain other kids were in. So I then realised that actually everything that they put me through wasn't my fault and it wasn't my responsibility and it wasn't their fault either because you know they were, they were effectively made that way by what they'd been through. So that made it a lot easier for me to forgive other people. And as I forgave a lot of people for what happened and I forgave myself, I noticed a lot of fear just dropped just went away and what I noticed is that there was a lightness that came in my life didn't feel anywhere near as heavy and then the creativity super flowed from there because I'd made space I'd made space for it to happen now we are into some quite frankly some fucking heavy salad right here and I really didn't expect this to be the way that we opened up month two at AAA. But to be honest with you, I didn't expect the first month to be as incredible as it was. And if this is going to be the shape of things to come, wow, are we going to make some progress together, guys? This is insane stuff. But ultimately, if we can do this, we can then all start getting into that flow state. That was one of the reasons why I asked about whether you guys have mindfulness and meditation practices, because I want to, I'm going to start running a whole list of masterclasses with friends of mine who are wellness experts, practitioners, etc., who can really help us to hack the flow state in the studio. And there's a degree of self-work that we can do on that as well. And don't get me wrong, you know, all of these experiences are amazing inspiration for writing music. You know, again, like my track, The Becoming, this year, was about the breakthroughs that I'd made on my journey of self-discovery and self-growth and, ironically, becoming the person I was always meant to be. I wouldn't change any of it for the world. I have literally no regrets at all about anything that I've been through because it's made me who I am and it's taught me so much. So again, number three, self-acceptance. I mean, the funny thing is, I was in a position about three or so years ago where the concept of self-acceptance was so alien to me that I had to Google what it was. I literally tap, typed into Google on my phone. Like, how do I accept myself? And, you know, to sound a bit Instagrammy again for a second... How do I love myself? Because how am I capable of giving love to anyone else if I can't give love to myself, first and foremost? And how can I give love to people in the form of music if I can't feel that love for myself as well? So self-acceptance is a huge part of it. Accept yourself as you are right now. 
accept who you are as you sit, stand, lie down, listening to this in whatever situation you're in. And not just intellectually understand that you are enough because up here in the mind, yeah, we can, we can get all sorts of stuff. You know, I, I got it for years. Oh, yeah, I should love myself. Yeah, I should accept myself. Yeah, 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 all right, yeah, whatever. And then never really felt it. So I want you guys to feel right now that you guys are enough and that you are good enough as you are. Which ironically, in your imperfectness, makes you about as perfect as anyone's ever going to be. And you are. It's the imperfections that make people interesting. It's the imperfections in music that make the tracks classic. That's why tracks that are 30 or so, or even older tracks, still timeless. How is that the case? Because they're not perfect. A lot of them are fucking recorded onto mad wonky tape machines and that tapes and probably fucking worse so think about it accept yourself as you are it's a huge very powerful process and of course based on what we talked about earlier non-attachment I've saved the biggest and the most difficult one for last to truly be not attached to a goal. To know that you are much more than just the achievement of a goal. That you're a human body or you're a human spirit in a body, you know. I love that. <laughs> I love that quote as well, you know. You're a ghost driving a meat-covered skeleton on a rock that's doing a million mile an hour around a ball of fire. What the fuck have you got to be scared of? <laughs> so, you know, think about it. I love what Gary Vaynerchuk says about that, you know. The chances of you even being here right now in this form is fucking mental. It's like four billion to one, you know? And our fucking gobs are tripping us because we're not getting signed to record labels. The fact that we're even here is a miracle. And it means that we're so much more than the tracks we write. We're so much more than the DJ sets we put up for people to scrutinise. We're so much more than our press photos. We're so much more than the clang mix we did at a gig once. We're so much more than the deafening silence we get from a lot of record labels because they're too busy to reply. And we're definitely more than what we think we are. That's the honest answer. So non-attachment is huge. Because again, in not being attached to the goal, it means that you are sending the message that you are okay whether or not this goal happens or whether this situation arises or not. Which, as I say, ironically, makes that situation far, far more likely to happen. You know? So, yeah. I knew this was going to be a doozy tonight, guys. Wow. Huge. So let's take this, right? Let's take this knowledge of the last hour and 37 minutes and let's see how we can apply this, okay? So, let's have a look at some comments, shall we? I'm just going to get Dennis's up here first of all, because Dennis has a beautiful story. He really has, you know? So, let's just read this. With regards to music and life, sets the bar very high. And again, there's nothing wrong with having, like, you know, high hopes and high standards. Very different from, you know, having high expectations. Okay. Sometimes this isn't a bad thing. Other times it can be a curse and it can be limiting. I mean, you have to be realistic. 
recently have turned down quite a few gigs and I do believe this is down to confidence. Okay, so there's an interesting conversation to be had about confidence there as well because we, we act like confidence is this like currency, you know, like the way, you know, the pound is or the dollar or the euro or, you know, I don't know, the Indian rupee or whatever. We act like, you know, this confidence thing is something that we can just go out to a shop and buy or exchange for something else. And it isn't. It's Confidence is a side effect. And it's a side effect of performance. That's all it is. But also as well, it's a side effect of self-acceptance. If you've completely accepted yourself or if you accepted yourself to a higher level, then confidence isn't hard to come by because... Quite frankly, you haven't got a fucking thing to prove to anyone. So actually, again, this points back inward. It points back towards self-acceptance. As a recovering addict, I certainly see the world very differently to how I did when I had a residency back in the late 90s. So obviously Dennis has you know, got a very, very personal story here, which I really want to honour him for... You know, I'm really, you know, show a lot of gratitude for him being so honest here. I feel quite happy when I'm by myself in the studio. However, when I'm around people, I struggle with social anxiety. It's not like I can have a beer to take the edge off. I do try to step outside my comfort zone, but I just don't feel the time is right to be playing out. Dude, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. It really is. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, if that's your natural habitat then that's totally fine at this moment in time. I would say that, you know, if it is an aspiration of yours to play out eventually, then, you know, you'll grow. And when the time's right, it'll happen. And again, you do like to push yourself outside your comfort zone as well. So that's that's a brilliant thing. And that will progress for you, I'm sure. So I guess my biggest fear is, will I ever think I'm good enough? I don't know. I watch artists playing their own tracks quite happily and I'm nowhere near that point just yet. I'm hoping this will change over time. I also feel that when I have a track that I've made that I'm happy to include in a set, this will be a turning point. Yeah, so what I would say is that there's a few things to go through there. You know, when I have a track, what you've eff effectively said there at the end, and again, this is not, I'm not apportioning blame, I'm not criticizing, I'm just being constructive here. When I have a track that I'm happy to include in a set, I will be happy. However, what will happen is, is that when you're happy, you will end up with a track that you will be more than elated to include in a set. So the whole thing starts and stops with self-acceptance, which again is something we all struggle with, right? So that fear of failure can be dropped as we learn to learn to accept ourselves and learn to know that we're enough regardless of whether or not that happens. Again, we keep, you know, a portion and value to external external achievements when the truth is is that internally we're worth much more than that so hopefully that helps mate so as nick said i think my biggest fear is failure and disappointing people i also think that that's the reason i can be so awkward around people that i don't know or look up to and that's why it all I feel on my best being alone in my room or studio. So yeah, and look, some people are naturally introverted, and that's totally okay. And actually, actually, if you think about it, most really well-known DJs are quite introverted, and it's a way for them to express themselves musically in a way that they can't express with words. So again. Don't beat yourself up for being socially awkward. Don't beat yourself up for feeling better if you're on your own or in the studio. In the studio, or you know, you feel a little bit uh, when you meet people that you admire. 
I can tell you a story about when I was eight years old, I met my footballing idol, a guy called John Barnes. He played for Liverpool and England, scored probably the best goal ever in international football history for England against Brazil in Brazil in 1984. And that guy just signed for Liverpool and I absolutely adored this man. And honestly, like my legs went. I literally, he was holding me up for the photo. So don't talk to me about being a bit awkward when you meet people you look up to. I nearly fainted when I met mine, (laughs) even though I was eight years old, but whatever. But the thing to bear in mind is that these people, and one of the things I did learn in my time in LA in particular was, you know, I met some crazy people, you know, not to get into like a name dropping exercise, but I met a lot of very, very well-known and very successful and very well-respected people. They all have one thing in common. They're all the same. They're just people. It's all they are. They're just humans like me and you. Like I said before, you know, Bradley Wiggins does one of the most incredible things in British sport in history. Still got to go and take the trash out. Still got to go to the supermarket. Still got to wipe his own ass. You know, as I rather crudely say about these people, you know, they all shit out the same old we do. So don't treat them any differently because they don't want that because they're just normal people. And the people who do want that are probably the ones who aren't worth knowing. So, yeah. So hopefully that helps both you and Clyde. Jules, perfectionism. Yeah. So perfectionism, extreme expectation. Setting the bar too high, the inner critic. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have to deal with that inner critic because we all have that from time to time. And that's honestly where the mindfulness and the meditation can really come in because it allows you to separate from your own thinking. It allows you to just take a step back and observe So the key to meditation is to understand, actually, what are you? Are you the thought that's happening in your own head right now? Or are you the, shall we say, loving awareness of that thought taking place and witnessing that thought taking place? That's actually you. You're not your thoughts. Thoughts are just thoughts. I mean, if every thought that I had every day had value, Jesus Christ, my life would be a shit show. Trust me. So, yeah, the inner critic is just that. It's just a thing in your head based on experiences that you've had. And it's a part of the unhealthy side of the ego that is looking to try and keep you safe. It's actually a defense mechanism that's there to wire you towards staying safe. Fear of failure, as Jewel says here. Like, what if the music thing doesn't work out uh, when I want it more than anything else in the world? Pressure right there. Yeah. And, yeah. And, again, wanting attachment expectation. Again, not saying it's easy, but I'm just saying if you can let go of some of that, your flow will happen quite nicely. You will be in a creative flow because, again, it's creating space. Meditation, again, you create space between you and your thinking. And if you get really good at it, you can, again, you can come into what I call a persistent meditative state where, you know, you could be meditating on an almost permanent basis day by day just by how your awareness is. So that inner critic is definitely limiting And it's definitely something that I interface with on a very, very regular basis. So, yeah, that pressure is self-inflicted. So it's something to be aware of. So really, you know, as I've titled the description of this live tonight, what we need to get to is a point where we can get out of our own way. Because it's interesting, isn't it? You know, we've all hit those creative flow states We've all gotten in the zone and we've all felt that state of like just no mind whatsoever where we're just creating, we're not thinking. And it's curious, isn't it? Because where does the inner critic go then? Where does the 
little voice inside of our heads that says, you're not good enough. Why don't you get a normal job? What the fuck are you doing that for? It just goes away. It just, there's nowhere to be seen. So, that's what we're looking for. Or even when those thoughts do happen, you don't attach value to them because they're not a reflection of reality. You know, we have over something like, was it 20,000 thoughts a day? 99% of them is complete bullshit. Imagine if we remembered every thought we had every day. Jesus fucking Christ. That'd be like hell on earth. So yeah, Jules, just let go of that perfectionism if you can, mate, just a little touch. Okay, so Radu, the guy who started all of this off, shall we say, which I'm very, very thankful for because it's, it's been a great conversation. And again, I'm saying a lot of this for myself rather than anyone else. It's almost, it's a great reminder to myself and if it resonates with you guys and it helps you, then brilliant. Okay. What I see deep inside is a constant fear of the unknown mixed with the feeling that I want to quit my job as a chef for good, even though I'm good at it and passionate about it. It takes care of a good money income, but drains all of my stamina and focus. Somehow with years passing, I enter the comfort zone, unable to get out. What I see on a daily basis is I think about music and how much I want to do it. The next thing, a creepy subconscious thought of fear kicks in. This is my usual overthinking of everything. See myself from an outside perspective and I start changing slowly things that need readjustments just to end up after a few months doing the same mistakes, having the same fears, now even greater. I'm moving from one country to another in an attempt to find a well-balanced place to live. There's an interesting one. I do have a fear for the direction of our society and I think it's losing fast its core values. Growing up in Romania, all I heard from my family is leave music, you won't earn money, blah, blah, blah. There are far better people doing music better than you. That old chestnut. So this is just a short summary. Pretty sure a lot can relate to this. Hopefully moving next week to Barcelona will put me on the right path to doing things differently and step up the game. It's interesting because if I can relate my own experience to this for a second, and not a lot of people know this, that wasn't my Michael Caine impression, by the way. I actually, when I lived in LA, I lived in LA for two years, pretty much on and off, touring around everything else. But I was based in LA for two years. And I had a, a lovely apartment round the corner from the studio that me and Sasha were working in together. And in all of the places that I lived, I mean, I started in Venice Beach and I then lived in Santa Monica for a bit. And then I lived in Hollywood for a bit with my then girlfriend. And then I lived in North Hollywood for a bit. You know, I jumped around a little bit within LA. But in all the places that I lived while I was there, and I lived in this apartment around the corner from the studio the most, for the longest time, it was like over a year. I actually never unpacked my suitcase. So I was pretty much living in the same apartment for a year, but I never unpacked my suitcase. It's not a weird thing to do. And I'm just getting a sense of this as well here with you, Radu, where you're, you know, moving from one country to another in an attempt to find a well-balanced place to live, which, you know, is totally fine you've got to feel at home you've got to feel at home somewhere but also as well home as they say is where the heart is and the last time i noticed our hearts are located within us inside of our bodies so home is also a place within so if you can find that home within yourself i think everything else for you will fall into place and the the fears will will drop as a result of hopefully what we've talked about tonight and you know coming to some realizations because again i've moved around quite a bit i've lived in different countries you know I lived in la 
I've lived in London for a bit, lived in, you know, various different places around the world on and off. And for some reason, I keep coming home to Liverpool. Why? Well, because, you know, it's it's a great place for me to live as a creative, if I'm being honest. But also as well, you know, I've got family here and it's very easily connectable. Although that might not be the case at the end of this month, but we won't go there. But ultimately, you know, I'm always home, no matter where I'm at, whether I'm in Sydney or New York or Ibiza or LA or Stuttgart or Frankfurt or anywhere else. Because I'm always home within myself. You know, a lot of people ask me like, oh, where, where, you know, where's home for you? And I often like just, you know, point at myself and I'm like, well, I'm home right now. Because if you can find that home within yourself, then you can feel at home anywhere and you can feel well balanced anywhere. So if you're finding that you're moving from country to country to find somewhere well balanced, you might want to travel within a little bit to find that balance within yourself and then the right place will then present itself. Great stuff, mate. I can't thank you enough, Radu, for being so honest because we literally wouldn't be having this conversation right now if it wasn't for you. So thank you so much, dude. Thank you so much. So Geraint here, who again blew us away. Oh, and uh, Dennis says here, Radu, check out a book called The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, which is wicked. It's, it's a brilliant book. And again, there'll be more book recommendations made at the end of this which, you know, will plumb the depths very much so. Okay, so again, perfectionism, Malk, seeing the same thing, perfectionism again, getting too attached to things and ideas have made, need to be more ruthless, I think that means. It's not about ruthlessness, because, like, again, ruthlessness, it's an angry energy, if you think about it. It's like, you know, it's not about being ruthless. I just think it's about being more in flow. I think in the flow state. If you can get yourself into the flow state on a more regular basis, and again, this is where goals and systems come in and being able to create. I mean, what is a system if it's not creating a schedule, but it's also creating a, you know, an environment. Again, we, we touched upon it last week, didn't we, with ergonomics, where if you can create an environment that's optimal for creativity, and I mean a, a physical environment that you're comfortable with, and also an internal environment for yourself, within yourself, that you're comfortable creating in. It def definitely makes a big difference. But that first step is on the internal part of self-acceptance and, again, letting go of that extreme expectation of perfectionism. Malk. Never fleshing out really good loops, ideas, and arrangements, comparing 16 bar loops to pro tracks before even attempting to sort any structure or mix down and then binning them. That dude is like 101 of what I see. You know, I have to constantly remind people, and again, this is about having realistic reference and capabilities as well. You know, you, you can, and again, like that's the point that I was making before about unfairly comparing myself to, like, fucking legends. And if you're sat there with a 16-bar loop comparing yourself to, like, Enrico San Giuliano or Max Cooper or, you know, Jamie Jones or whoever else you want to pull out, you know, Massio Plex, Quiver, you know, whoever, whoever you're into, that's not helpful. And what I often say as well, you know, in terms of the structure or the mix down and stuff like that, a lot of people, you know, come to me with tracks and they say, like, well, how come mine doesn't sound like that? And it's like, well, because, you know, you have to think about it. This track that you're referring and comparing yourself to is actually finished, professionally mixed, professionally mastered. This label can afford the best in the business. For example, like drum code. I often say that a professional mix down, a professional master can add anything up to 30% of the quality of the final product. And I'm quite privileged in 
the bits of mix and the mastering work that I do for people still, that I get to hear people's productions in a more raw state. And I can, you know, with permission, I can play pre-masters and I can play mastered stuff. And I can play pre-mixed stuff, raw finished productions right the way through to pre-masters and masters. And the difference is astonishing. So if that helps you to let go of that belief, then all good stuff. Okay. Now, another one for me, as Malk says, is liking far too many genres and trying to make them all. <laughs> it's not a problem, mate. It's not a problem. What you do, if I put my artist development coach's hat on, is you have different projects and different artist names for each one. You know, I, you know, I, I had, a, I've got a few of them myself, you know. I did some real sort of punky, you know, justice type stuff a few years back. And I called myself Midi Evil, which I still love as a name and I might still resurrect as a project. Because I love that shit, but doesn't fit Paul Nolan. You know. So if you've got different genres that you need to desperately scratch the itch of, have different buckets and different artist projects for each one. It's kind of like the difference between, say, Richie Horton as a DJ and as an artist and Plastic Man. It's kind of like the difference between Masio Plex, Metric and Marialito. kind of like the difference between Eric Prids and Sir SD. Yeah. So, I would definitely say that's not a problem. Also, having three song ideas in one track and it not flowing properly. Well, yeah, I mean, that will that will alleviate itself now. If you look, if again, if you think about the less is more, you know, if you've got three ideas and they're not flowing properly, then separate them out. You've essentially written three tracks. Congratulations, you've just written an EP. All good. So I'm just going to go into the comments here a little bit for this stream because I'm just seeing a few bits of interest and conversation happen. Okay. So let me just dial through here. Marcos, I remember every negative thought and experience I've had, and it's, it is hell on earth. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I remember a lot of this shit as well. And, you know, I'm kind of a bit calm about it now because, you know, we're, we're sitting and having a serious conversation about it. And what I can say is if you can get to the root of where the negative thoughts and the experiences come from, obviously the experiences are, you know, things that you've been through, either things that you've put yourself through or things that you've experienced at the hands of other people or, you know, other situations. If you can get to the root of it within yourself and, again, even though it might not be your responsibility of how you came to feel that way, but if you can take responsibility for that feeling and then be able to let that feeling go. And again, this is all easier said than done, and this is a process that can take some people the rest of their lives. But if you commit to that process, your life will instantly and very quickly get a lot better. So... Da -da 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 -da. No, it's all good, mate. It's all good, and I get it. It's like a sad movie playing on the loop in your head over and over again. Hey, we're not here scoring on people's grammars. Again, remember, don't have to be perfect, yeah? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is for sure, and it can be like that, but it doesn't have to be like that. No, it doesn't have to be like that because... As I say, outside of the suffering that we naturally have to do as human beings through, you know, death of loved ones or life-threatening danger. 
everything else is as difficult as this sounds is a choice that we can make and we can choose to do something different and we can choose to do something about it I'm not saying it's an easy choice I'm not saying it's a choice that a lot of people will commit to because most people are run and controlled by their fear on a very unconscious basis I still am to an extent you know I'm not presenting myself don't get this twisted I am no expert I'm not a guru I am not a scientist I'm not a therapist I'm not any of these things I'm just somebody who's been through shit who know knows how it feels and for some reason I just can communicate about it in the hope that you guys can be helped by this and I'm again using this platform as a way of doing this because I desperately well not desperately but you know I just really 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 want to help people because I know it doesn't have to be this way because I decided to look very deeply at what my limiting beliefs were and what my experiences were and how they were unconsciously controlling me another thing that I, I like another piece of advice is whatever you don't change you choose and you know doing nothing is still doing something but you take the first step on that journey and guarantee things will unravel in positive ways for you guys so i'd like to sort of finish up tonight by referring to as you know a very good friend of mine a very very good friend of mine uh, which i will move out and i'm going to move myself over here okay so text might be a little bit small let me uh see if i can do anything about that don't think i can but i'll read it out to you anyway probably come out in the video a lot better so patrice's posts have been a real source of inspiration not just for me but for a lot of people in recent times because he's been raw open and quite honest and this is kind of my favorite quote of all really and it's about dealing with jealousy okay so let me just read this out here dealing with jealousy in any competitive field such as djing we are confronted with the fact that other people are more successful than we are comparison right this creates a feeling of jealousy and low self-worth within us which is amplified by social media it can be amplified how i would like to respond to that is i think exactly what we're doing right now is just about the most positive use of social media i can think of which is again an exception rather than the rule at the moment but i'm sure that will change Patrice continues, he says, I grapple with this emotion myself and notice it in many, often extremely accomplished artists. Jealousy lets us focus on what we lack, what we don't have compared to others and ignore our own good fortune. It traps us in negative thought patterns. Why not me, right? So think about it. We forget to think about what we actually have going for us because we're so focused on what we don't have. Negative thinking attracts struggle and scarcity. And again, a few of you said, oh yeah, I really struggle with that. And the key is to manoeuvre and grow to a point where struggle the struggle is less. I mean, I don't think the struggle ever stops, but I do think we can lessen the struggle for ourselves and let things be a little more easy so negative thinking kills creativity and personal growth the opposite is also true positive thoughts invite love opportunity and a higher caliber of humans into our lives here are a few things that help me get into a positive state of mind number one being grateful this is a superpower 
instead of feeling annoyed about having to be the warm-up DJ, it helps to remember that playing to people is a privilege. And being able to do this and, you know, communicate with each other and help each other grow in this way is a privilege in and of itself. And it's a fantastic privilege that I'm honoured to carry for you guys. And I'm, I'm honoured to to serve you guys. I really am. I'm incredibly grateful for all of your passion and love and support in this group. Gratefulness should extend to things. <laughs> should. Gratefulness could extend to things we take for granted. Health, friends and family, having access to infinite knowledge on the internet. Jealousy cannot exist in the same space as gratefulness. It's a very, very good point. Quit in the rat race. It's easy to get trapped in the race for popularity and success. So when Patrice talks about quitting the rat race, he's not talking about quitting a nine-to-five job in an office and pursuing your dream of being a DJ because that's essentially just swapping one rat race for another. It's easy to get trapped in the race for popularity and success. Everything is measurable. Social media likes, DJ fees. But we all have different starting points different talents and different flaws. We don't get to pick our looks or where we're born. The only valid comparison is the one with our former selves. There you go. If you are sat here right now and you are 1% better than you were in the past, congratulations. You're a wonderful human being. And even if you aren't, you're wonderful anyway. You're just on the path. Okay, focus on your own growth. So again, that whole thing of comparing ourselves against artists that you know we have no business comparing ourselves to, and even the ones that are on our level, don't even think about it. We're all on our own unique path. Measure success by your own rules and don't limit yourself to fame and money. No blaming, no complaining. The moment I took ownership of my shortcomings and refused to blame others, my life transformed. This requires brutal honesty, but is the starting point onto a path of continuous personal growth. I am not a victim, I am in charge, and I am responsible. And again, when I say, you know, you accept yourself, that is another way of saying it. It's another way of saying that I take responsibility for who I am. And I accept myself whole, including all of my shortcomings. Genuinely being happy for the good fortune of others. Generosity creates abundance. Simply trust, and there's a massive word to finish on, on trust. Trust that there is enough good stuff out there for all of us, because there is. Patrice finishes off by saying, I am writing this list for myself as much as for you. Overcoming jealousy is hard, but it will make us better artists, better colleagues, better friends, and more appreciative of the good things happening around us. And I think that is, quite honestly, a wonderful point to finish up on. Be grateful for who you are. Be grateful for everything that you have going for you because you have way more going for you than you think. Accept yourself. Take ownership, take responsibility for yourself. It's not as big or as horrible or as scary as it sounds. And I can guarantee you, as Patrice would, and as Michael would say at the beginning, I guarantee that if we commit to the process and we let go of everything else, things will start falling into place for all of us. I can guarantee that. I want to thank you all for your time, your love and your attention this evening. This has been kind of meditative for me, really. I've been wanting to say a lot of this for a long time to people in a forum such as this. So I want to thank you and I want to thank every one of you that are members and have supported this platform through the last month and what it's growing into in the future. And thank you again for just being so open to this type of conversation and I'm sure 
when we need to have these conversations again, whether it be on a regular basis or whether we bring in experts or other artists in to talk about this, then we're going to do that in a very, very big way. So I'm looking forward to Thursday. We're going to get our reverb on. We're going to get into some multidimensional mixing and multidimensional sound design. And we're going to really, really hammer into what reverbs are all about. So again, guys, I can't thank you enough for everything and for tonight as well. And this will be up ASAP. And yeah, I think for this one, you know, you may need to go back and listen to this a few times because there's a lot, there's a lot to it. And I think it's something that could definitely support us into the future. So just to finish off with a few comments, James. Thanks everyone and yourself, Paul, for being so real and sharing your personal experiences and journey. This class has really resonated deeply. It's given me a lot to think about. I'll definitely have to rewatch this class about three times to digest it. Took the words right out of my mouth, brother. I'm glad to be here. I'm an open book dude, no matter what. Thanks, Nick. And again, thanks for being so open again. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, dudes. Have a great week. Thank you, Sinisa. And I shall leave you to enjoy the rest of the Okay then, so there you have it. There was, well, me talking about overcoming the fear of failure and really a whole lot more. And it's amazing when we get into these types of conversations and these types of thought processes, what can come up and how wide we can go and how deep we can go as well. So this is something that I'm pretty proud of. I really spoke from the heart in this because it reflected a lot of my own experiences and the experiences of people who I know, peers, people who I love in the industry, and also a lot of the NYT membership and again as I say coaching clients that I've had over the years in a one-to-one -one capacity so I hope you enjoyed that I hope you've taken a lot from that and that is going to do it for the Beyond the Studio 10th episode I thank you so much for listening please do consider subscribing if you haven't already giving us a follow on Spotify subscribing on Apple Podcasts particularly would be great if you could drop us a review as well and of course share it with your friends and if you want to watch video versions of most episodes of beyond the studio this one is an audio only affair uh, due to the way that we cut the video over the years and uh, basically we've got a lot more like this and more on the myt youtube channel so if you head over to youtube.com forward slash make your transition give us a subscribe we were just around about six thousand subscribers the last time i checked that we want to head towards ten thousand. so if you can do that for us give us a subscribe give our videos some likes and give them some loves drop some comments get involved with the discussion on the various videos there you will be able to watch them all all episodes of beyond the studio in a nice convenient place all in one playlist and get the benefits of all the other video and content we've got on there anyway that will do it for this week i truly promise that now i am definitely going i shall see you next week for another episode of beyond the studio that's it for now stay safe stay sound and i'll speak to you soon goodbye Catch new episodes of Beyond the Studio every single week on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts.